So about a third of women who get pregnant have problems with their asthma where it gets worse. About a third get better and another third actually asthma does not change. So asthma control remains about the same. That happens because there are some factors, some physiologic factors that happen during pregnancy that may make asthma worse and some that may make asthma better. Some of the factors that make asthma worse are things like heartburn, uh, sinus congestion, sinus disease, or a higher susceptibility to infections, for instance. So all of these factors might contribute to asthma getting worse. And there are some factors, again, that make it get better some hormonal factors might be important but what we don't know is who is going to get better and who is going to get worse because so far there's no way to predict how a woman is going to do in the next pregnancy we do know that uh, women who have had complications in a prior pregnancy might be more likely to have a complication in an index pregnancy but we don't know for a fact yet Uh, so asthma may negatively impact pregnancy. We know uh, from data that come from large registries that uh, women that have asthma, especially when asthma is poorly controlled, they tend to have negative outcomes happen. So things like preeclampsia have been described, uh, preterm birth, small for gestational age, and these are complications for the mom. There are also some complications in the newborn and then complications later in life. So things in the newborn that have been described are um, things like congenital anomalies, like cleft palate. The things that we don't know though uh, for sure is that whether asthma itself is what is impacting these uh, negative outcomes or whether it's treatment for asthma or any confounding factors that happen in asthmatics. So women that have uh, poorly controlled asthma, for instance, maybe women who smoke, we know that smoking can lead to congenital anomalies and to growth restriction. So in these larger data sets, we can't really tell or uh, separate out asthma from these other potential confounding factors. But what we do know from women that have been followed through prospective studies is that most women that are actively being followed and are well controlled don't have uh, a higher risk of these complications. The only thing that does persist is a higher risk for preeclampsia. Uh, so we monitor women that have asthma a little bit closer in pregnancy. We try to see them, if they are well controlled, about once a trimester or so to make sure that their asthma is well controlled. If they are not well controlled, then we follow them a little more closely because uh, you know, we're afraid about medications, we're afraid about any complications happening and impacting pregnancy. But there are also some um, differences in how we follow these women in that the questionnaires, for instance, that we use to determine whether a woman has well-controlled asthma or not, they're not as predictive of, of good control as they are outside of pregnancy, again because of the physiologic changes that happen in pregnancy. So for instance, more than 50% of women that um, are pregnant have some a feeling of being short, short of breath at some point during pregnancy. So when we ask them, have you been short of breath in the past four weeks, for instance, the majority are gonna say yes, but if we don't ask them if this is specific for asthma, we're gonna be a little bit off in terms of telling who's well controlled and who's not. And uh, we also follow them with a breathing test because there are some older data, nothing that has been done recently, uh, but at least the older data are reliable enough in that lung function by itself, regardless of symptoms, may be predictive of poor outcomes in pregnancy. So when we do a breathing test and we see that, uh, that the asthma, uh, the lung function is not as good as it's supposed to be, we try to act on it as well. So obviously in pregnancy, we worry about fetal safety. Uh, most of the medications that are used for asthma in general can be used in pregnancy. But having said that, there are some medications that are safer than others. And that's where that nuance of treatment becomes really important. So uh, medications like inhaled corticosteroids are safer in pregnancy, but the ones that we know the most about are budesonide and beclomethazone. But in some cases, many cases, we uh, use medications in, other, in the same class, but that are other than budesonide or beclomethazone. 
um, medications like Montelukast, for instance, for the majority, if patients need it as a third medication, as a third controller, for instance, and their asthma is not well controlled outside of that, then we keep them on it. But if we have a choice and we can switch to a safer drug, it would be better because there has been some cases where that has been associated with some congenital anomalies, even though it has been only in case reports and not too many, but it's still something that the FDA had been concerned about. And then medications like steroids, for instance, uh, when we decide to use steroids in pregnancy, it's because someone really needs it and it's a life-threatening condition or a serious enough condition. So in that case, we don't really hesitate about using steroids. And even though there have been studies that have shown that steroids are associated with some adverse outcomes, uh, possibly even preterm birth, we still don't hesitate to use them. I think it's important to do that because the health of the baby depends on the health of the mom. And if the mom requires this to be healthy, then we do that anyway. And then there's a, the newer class of medications, which are the biologics. The biologics don't have a lot of uh, human data. One of the biologics, which is omalizumab, uh, has some recent data about uh, a little less than 200 women that have been exposed to it in the first trimester. And it doesn't seem like they have complications but usually when we talk about uh, safety data in pregnancy, we talk about much larger numbers in order to determine that a drug is safe. And then there's a lot that we don't know in terms of how much of the drug is going to go to the newborn, is going to transfer to the newborn, and how long after it's going to persist in the newborn. And if that is the case, is that going to impact vaccination? Is that going to impact the health of the newborn or how um, whether they are going to be immunosuppressed or sensitive to any specific types of information. And the other thing about these medications is that, so the biologics, they all have a, um, a molecule, it's an IgG molecule, which is known to cross the placenta. So we know the fetus is going to get exposed to that drug around the second trimester or later. So what we don't know is how long we need to keep the mom on that drug before we stop it by labor and delivery, and how much is the baby going to get exposed to it, and if they are, how long is that going to last um, in cord blood and later in the, in, the fetal, in the neonatal circulation, and is that going to impact decisions like vaccinating the fetus, like their susceptibility to getting infections or think of that sort. So there's a lot that we don't know about these medications. There are some that have a registry that is ongoing, so we're waiting to get some data from these registries and hopefully we can make some better decisions.